Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Allen. I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. It's my sincere pleasure to welcome you all today to today's event concerning policing in the United States in the era of COVID-19. Featuring experts from the Miller Center at Rutgers University, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, and the security program at the University of Ottawa, we'll be assessing the impacts of this disease on our really important law enforcement community, the broader state of law enforcement in the nation today. Indeed, at this very moment, major police agencies are reporting absentee rates as high as 20% to officers who are either themselves <clears throat> afflicted with the virus or in need of self-quarantine. And I'll tell you, as a commander uh, who led troops in combat, 20% attrition of any organization is an enormous blow to the effectiveness and the morale of an organization. So our police are taking a lot of attrition. Reported crimes are generally down in America's cities as a result of many of the ongoing shutdown orders across the nation. Yet domestic violence and other crimes have in fact seen marked increases. But that said, it will likely be a long time before we understand the full scope of crime during the era of COVID-19. A matter affecting policing as, as it will so much of the rest of America will be financial issues. And these will emerge as well for our law enforcement community, if they haven't already, as states and cities struggle with budgetary implications of the significant contraction of tax revenues brought on by this crisis. At the same time, criminal organizations and extremist groups have been exploiting the situation for their own purposes, spreading disinformation in ways that could become very dangerous and very divisive for our population. Indeed, white nationalist groups and domestic terrorists, individuals who would seek to use this moment to further inflict harm on our communities of color or our faith-based communities, for their own purposes, these groups and their actions are on the rise. And finally, but perhaps most importantly, the mental health and longer term resilience and endurance of our law enforcement officers is a very real concern that should be a matter for all of us, that they work so hard to support their communities while also trying to keep their colleagues and their families and themselves healthy in every sense of the word. It's a real challenge. And I hope you'll listen attentively to what our, our guests have to say today on this matter. Now for the event itself, we are recording and streaming live. And if you'd like to ask a question uh, throughout our event, please send them to the email address events at brookings.edu. That's events.brookings.edu or Twitter using the hashtag uh, pandemic policing, pandemic policing. Now I'll now pass the floor to my good friend, dear friend, General Lori Robinson, who will offer some additional introductory remarks. First of all, General Allen, Lord, thank you. Thank you so uh, much. It's so great to see you again. And um, having had the pleasure to serve with you uh, alongside while you were in Afghanistan and I was in Qatar and, um, you know, having had the privilege to watch you lead uh, over there, it's nice to have the opportunity to be a part of this event. Um, sir, thank you so much. Um, the other thing I would like to say, thank you to Michael Hanlon for everything that he's done, um, you know, keeping, you know, me straight and narrow. And we all know that's not an easy thing for anybody that knows me. Um, so, uh, you know, I appreciate that. But most importantly, as a previous NORAD and NORTHCOM commander, specifically the NORTHCOM commander, um, understanding the um, role and responsibility that the military has to support uh, our law enforcement agencies from the strategic level down to the tactical level and everything that the law enforcement agencies do to implement um, everything that's necessary to take care of our families is just amazing. So I, I just really, it, from an introductory perspective, you know, I just really wanted to say how um, honored I am to have had the privilege to work with all of you to protect our homeland. 
You all are incredible people and what you do day in and day out um, to protect the homeland is uh, amazing. And uh, I watch with grace uh, every single day as I'm watching what's happening and going on. You, what you do for our communities and what you do for our families is nothing less than solid. And, uh, you know, we're grateful for everything. Um, so, you know, the interesting part for me is now I serve at home, um, but that doesn't mean I watch, don't watch what you're doing. So uh, I just wanted, before we get into this, to say thank you as a previous commander um, that was blessed uh, to be a part of your life. And so I'm gonna turn it now over to Michael. Thank you, General Robinson. Thank you, General Allen. And thank you everyone now that we're about to hear from who are all police experts on the general subject of American law enforcement and of course, dealing with the COVID-19 crisis. My job at this point is, is to very briefly introduce three recently retired police officers, leaders, especially in the New York and New Jersey and Florida and uh, other jurisdictions who will then themselves introduce currently serving active police leaders in New Jersey and New York, as well as at the Department of Homeland Security. And we'll have a bit of a conversation about how we're doing with policing in this era of COVID-19 before taking any of your questions that you may wish to direct our way as well. So very briefly, we'll begin with Jack Donahue who just retired uh, Chief Donahue was in the New York Police Department and the Chief of Strategic Initiatives where he focused on intelligence as well as countering extremism and other important priorities for one of the most revered and successful law enforcement operations and agencies in the entire planet. And he will uh, be followed then by Superintendent Rick Fuentes who used to run the New Jersey Police and is also now at Rutgers University Miller Center just as is Paul Goldenberg, who has done a great deal in his career dealing with the extremist threat and other kinds of challenges as a police officer, and also has uh, conducted a number of major initiatives dealing with the threat of extremism and ISIS and other such movements around the world, where I believe he and John Allen got to know each other working with the Department of Homeland Security Advisory Council. Paul is also at the Miller Center at Rutgers, and we're pleased to be collaborating with them today. So without further ado, Jack, over to you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce a longtime colleague, uh, Fausto Pichardo, who's a 22-year veteran uh, of the New York City Police Department and is currently serving as the Chief of Patrol. He's held a variety of patrol, investigative, and uh, other assignments during his career. Uh, people may not know uh, that the NYPD has 55,000 employees that keep New York City safe. And it's had a record of success that uh, New York City can be proud of, driving murders down from a peak of more than 2,200 a year in 1990 to little, uh, little less, uh, around uh, 300 over the last several years. And he's also working hard to maintain the trust of the public. Chief Pichardo is the chief of patrol, has the responsibility for nearly 20,000 police officers who patrol the 77 precincts in the five boroughs of New York City. He has some really great insights as to, into the current crisis and uh, has a ground truth perspective. Rick? Okay, I guess we're introducing uh, uh, the speakers uh, here and then we'll just go from one to the other. So uh, with his apologies, and I know uh, Colonel Callahan was, was supposed to be on the seminar, but uh, he's been called to a press conference uh, with the governor concerning COVID updates. And that press conference is going on as I speak. Uh, in his place, uh, after uh, Chief of Patrol Pichardo talks, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Lieutenant uh, Colonel uh, Jeffrey Noble, who is Deputy Superintendent, manages the daily operations of the division. Uh, not many people know that the superintendent of New Jersey State Police is also the state director of emergency management. When he has to don that hat, the deputy superintendent generally steps in uh, and handles the day-to-day -day operations of the organization, which with civilians and enlisted members is about 4,500 people. Uh, Colonel Noble is a 24-year veteran of the state police. He's a career homicide uh, investigator, and he's a former commanding officer of the state's uh, forensic laboratory system. Uh, he recently, for those who are ICP members, they may know Jeff is receiving 
uh, recently receiving the ISCP award for uh, innovation in criminal investigations for his crime gun intelligence uh, initiatives to solve uh, gun crime. Uh, he's the past president and current executive board member of the uh, New Jersey Homicide uh, Investigators Association. And I uh, guess, uh, Paul, I'll shift over to you to uh, introduce uh, the doctor and then we can go back to the chief of patrol. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rick. And uh, yeah, I'd like to first introduce uh, a friend, someone that, that has become a, a personal friend. That's Brian Darrow. Uh, Brian hails from, uh, from the beautiful state of Wisconsin. Um, when the department needed someone to uh, really put their arms around uh, uh, how the department engages and interacts with, uh, with the first responder community and the public safety community, uh, Brian Darrow was that person uh, that was selected. Uh, he not only comes from, uh, from our world, the first responder world, the police world, but he also uh, has a distinguished career in, uh, in academia. Uh, he's done an, an, an exemplary job out there working uh, in all 50 states, there isn't anywhere he hasn't been. Uh, he's been uh, front and center uh, since uh, since we've landed in this uh, this uh, very uh, peculiar place, and and has been out there with uh, with police departments across uh, the entire country. Um, Brian has has been working very closely with uh, with our folks on the border, on both borders, and uh, and is uh, highly regarded. Uh, by uh, by uh, the folks that are responsible for uh, protecting our uh, our infrastructure. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, also we'll be introducing a doctor uh, known as Dr. E. Dr. Eastman. Um, he he is a, a unique individual, uh, MD. Uh, he is the uh, a senior medical officer for operations for the entire department, but he also comes from the policing world. Uh, he holds the rank of lieutenant at the, at the Dallas Police Department and uh, is someone that uh, really is uh, 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 uniquely qualified to not only understand uh, the challenges that, uh, that police uh, persons have across this country, but uh, also has been in front and center since the beginning of, uh, of the pandemic and, and has a keen understanding of how that's impacting our, uh, our, uh, our men and women across the country. So. Um, as, a, uh, as a member of the uh, United States Department of Homeland Security Advisory Council, I'm very proud to uh, have the opportunity to introduce those two uh, fine individuals. Thank you. Wonderful, Paul. So now I would like to play the role of moderator and really just get one main question on the table for uh, our four main panelists to each address as they see fit. And then we'll have a little bit of follow-up discussion before taking audience questions. And the main concern, of course, is how is it going? in the police forces today with COVID-19, uh, what are your concerns about how your own forces holding up as well as the state of security within the United States uh, in terms of crime and other such matters? And, and where do the rest of us need to keep our eye on the ball to potentially uh, in the broader policy debate help you out based on problems that you see emerging or problems that could emerge? So just the question is gonna be what's on your mind What's concerning you? What do we need to do about it? And I say this, just one more word of context, although I'm sure most people are well aware, most listeners and observers, we've seen, as John Allen mentioned in the introduction, attrition rates in some of the police forces of 15 to 20%. I think it's less now in New York City, but Chief uh, Pichardo, I hope you can inform us about that. We've seen reports that some kinds of crime are down, but other kinds like domestic violence uh, and certain kinds of break-ins and and car thefts may be up. What kind of trends and concerns do you see there? And then more generally, it's, again, as John Allen uh, alluded to, we've got concerns about the ability of state and local governments to keep funding police forces at a time of such acute financial distress. So those are just some of the topics that could be on your mind. But, but Chief uh, Pichardo, if I could start with you, what are you most worried about and what do we have to do about that uh, to help you out and to ensure good law enforcement and safety in places like New York today. Thank you again very much for being here. Mike and, and, and to all generals, generals uh, Allen and Robinson, uh, to all the men and women of the military, uh, both here and abroad, thank you for your service. To my colleague, Jack Donahue, and all those on, on the panel and the men and women out in the street in law enforcement at this very minute, thank you for everything that they do day in and day out. And it's my absolute pleasure to join you here this afternoon. And look, I, I mean, these are extraordinary times. Uh, we all know that, not just living and working 
in the epicenter of uh, COVID-19, as we've seen time and time again in New York. Uh, we've lost 41 members with COVID-related illnesses that passed away, both uniformed and civilian. Uh, from a city of 8.6 million New Yorkers, the proverbial city that never sleeps has gone dormant. We're about 56 days into this. And uh, policing this pandemic, certainly not easy. Everyone here knows that both on this panel and watching throughout the country. And, and our most precious resources, what do I worry about every single day? Our people, our police officers, the, the, their health, of course, as we look in New York City, like we're rebounding and, and putting, pushing back on this and doing extremely well. Uh, but we have still over seven members who are in critical condition at various hospitals. And although we peaked out at about 7,000 members who were sick at one point, over 5,000 who tested positive for COVID and were ill, and uh, over 90% of those have returned to work, there's still a substantial amount of fear that as this uh, virus is pushing it back, that our members are, are gonna still contract it with the possibility, of course, our extended families, their loved ones at home, that they contract that. So from traditional crime, we're fighting, you know, shootings and, and murders and robberies to now we're, we're enforcing social distancing. Uh, the quote unquote new crime that we're fighting and we're facing in this city every single day. And uh, of course, budgetary issues are, are reeking around the corner, specifically in this city where we're well over a uh, projected $7 billion deficit in the city. This talks about cutting our next police class. Uh, which we so, so, so much need uh, as the city starts to open up in the next two to four weeks, we expect the crime surge uh, to, go, to go up as well. Uh, the 56th day, we've gone uh, pretty, pretty well, about 25% reduction in crimes, uh, specifically our felonious assaults and our, and our larcenies, uh, probably due to the fact that a lot of folks are staying home, that uh, people are not out at work but our burglaries of our commercial establishments and the residentials and our car thefts are through the roof, uh, 25 and uh, about 50% respectively. So, so there are a lot of concerns right now. At the top of my list though is first and foremost, the well-being, the continued well-being of our members so we can really get ready to, to police this city when we open up the doors. Chief, thank you very much. And before I go to Colonel Noble with really the same question, just one very quick follow-up. Is there anything particular that you think you're going to need by way of help besides making sure the city has the financial resources to bring in that next class? It sounded like you don't see any uh, way you can get by without that next incoming group, and you want to make sure that priority uh, continues. Obviously, you want top uh, flight medical care for your own people. Is there anything else that's, that might be needed by way, for example, of the National Guard helping in any kind of additional way beyond what's already been uh, witnessed anything else specific that you can put your finger on already where the policy community should be getting ready to help you out? That's a, that's a great point. And, and listen, aside from uh, being a well-resourced uh, agency to our, our local state and federal partners, and, and we had the U.S. Oh, Comfort, sorry. we had uh, a tremendous amount of support from the state police, other municipalities within within the city of New York, uh, I, I think it's really on the policy side. Uh, I would say uh, we're facing, uh, as you heard, uh, very well publicized at the beginning of this year, various criminal justice reforms. Uh, oh, God, we, we released in this city uh, over 1,500 inmates from jails, uh, from jails through, throughout the city and, of course, more throughout the state. Uh, from the parole side, the parole stipulations and violations that uh, some of the folks had that we need to keep behind jail. Those were lifted and without. So I think on the policy side, it's really the criminal justice reform push that we need to kind of level out. And there was an attempt made at it. Uh, I'm not quite sure that, that we're where we want to be to protect the 8.6 million New Yorkers and then some that travel uh, throughout this city on a daily basis. Thank you very much. And now shifting our gaze to the Garden State, uh, if I could, Colonel Noble, really the same question to you. What's on your mind? How are people holding up? What are your concerns and what needs to be done? 
Well, good, good afternoon. And first of all, thank you so much for having us and for allowing the New Jersey State Police to be to be part of this discussion. Um, just like the chief said, we our number one concern, my number one concern, and the, and certainly Colonel Callahan's is just like the chief said, it's the safety and the, and the mental well-being of all of our troopers and our and our officers that are serving. Uh, time and time again, it's just it, we've seen moments and. Um, times of just great uh, calls to service by our men and women that are out there serving. Uh, as as you as we all know, our folks have responded uh, bravely. We've responded to this crisis uh, without a lot of information. We all recognize that this pandemic was something that um, we never went to a to a class or a or a course on handling a COVID nineteen crisis. Yet here we here we are and. The, and the great men and women and, and law enforcement, not just here in New Jersey, but certainly, uh, you know, all, all across the country have just stepped up. And I, we see that day to day. We see our men and women bravely doing everything they can and, and in many cases coming up with their own solutions. And one of the things that we recognize is that the regional um, response uh, needs to be regionalized. Every region here in, 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 in our state, we've got such broad um, density uh, we've got areas that are very dense. We have areas that are rural and each region is certainly different. And, and one thing we've seen is that although we need to have a consistent message that comes from our leadership, from the state, from the, from the federal level down, but ultimately it comes down to the municipal police chiefs, the municipal commanders that are making decisions in the interest of their own town. And um, so in that spirit, one of the things that we've really had to stay focused on is just centralizing that point of information so that um, because the biggest, one of the concerns we had is just, is the, is the messaging piece. A lot of different messages were, were, were sort of uh, being relayed to our various uh, folks throughout the state. So we really uh, were concerned about that. So we, through our, through leveraging our, our fusion center, which is our regional operations center, we centralized, we created a, a point of centralized communication. So all information is coming through that fusion center. And that for us has, has sort of helped, um, I think, our law enforcement officers on the front lines have a clear, consistent message. Uh, we recognize that in this time of great debate and concern, uh, our people of our, of our communities are certainly concerned or scared. And we also recognize that our officers, too, are trying to do their jobs to the best uh, that they can and, and, and making sure that they get a clear, consistent message uh, through the various chains of, of command has just been uh, critical. Um, we worry about uh, things like PPE for our officers. I think that's a, a very legitimate conversation that every police commander needs uh, across the country is concerned about. We've created some mechanisms where we can analyze uh, and track the level of PPE that we're burning through every day. And I can talk about that in a little more detail. And then lastly, our biggest concern is our, is our most vulnerable citizens. Uh, we absolutely, uh, having most of our citizens, uh, other than the essential uh, workforce, stay indoors um, creates a, a, a safety net for those predators that are preying on our most vulnerable citizens, whether that be domestic violence, whether that be children that are living in some type of uh, physical harm. Uh, so having to focus on the outreach to make sure that they have the mechanisms they need uh, to contact us and that we have the ability to respond is certainly one of our one of our greatest priorities um, currently. Uh, and that's that's probably the, the top three uh, issues for me, uh, Mike. Michael, if I could interrupt, because I'm gonna I'm gonna have to run because I've got something else I need to do, but General Allen would will really uh, resonate with this. The other thing that I worry a lot about is all of our caregivers, whether it's the police the nurses, the doctors, and PTSD. You know, we'll, 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 we'll get through this part. The question will be, you know, when we've got that quiet time until the second wave comes, and I firmly believe there's gonna be a second wave. We can, we can dispute that all you want. Um, but, you know, how do we take care of the people that are going out on the road with the policemen and women, out on the road with our firefighters, out on the road with our first responders, out on the road with the doctors and the nurses and, and, and with the PTSD. So, you know, as you guys are chatting with this, and I apologize, I have to run, but as you're chatting about this, 
it's something that I, I think is um, needs to be part of the national dialogue. And, and the militaries had to deal with that. Um, uh, and it took us a long time to figure out part of it. And so the, what are the lessons learned that we as the military can impart onto our fellow brothers and sisters? So General Allen and Michael, I, I hand that off to you. Um, but um, I, just, I, I just think it's something important to think about. Thank you, Laurie. And uh, now very good. Thank you. Very good. If I could go to Secretary Darrow, I wanted to thank you for joining us as well. And really the same question to you, although I suppose from a more national perspective of how do you see the overall trend lines with policing in the time of COVID? What's most concerning to you? What kinds of policy interventions that we haven't yet invoked might we need to consider? Over to you, Mr. Secretary. Sounds good, thank you. And first of all, I just wanna commend our law enforcement community. I have the privilege, the honor of serving as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for DHS. And my responsibility includes outreach to the 18,000 police departments, the 3,000 sheriff's offices, and all the national associations. And every day we stand ready to help. And it's been uh, pretty eye-opening watch the resiliency of our first responders and, the, and everything that they've been doing to keep our communities uh, intact. From my perspective, what we've been doing on a daily basis is trying to figure out how we provide guidance to our law enforcement community. I'll give you an example, a few weeks ago under uh, Dr. Alexander Eastman's uh, direction, who you're going to hear from in the near future, this gentleman I consider uh, DHS, DHS's MVP for all the incredible work that he has done. We released a uh, COVID-19 exposure and risk mitigation best practices resource guide uh, basically a one shop uh, stop so you can law enforcement can get the resources they need on, on mitigation of risk and exposure. Another example is we recently released the Department of Homeland Security COVID-19 partner threat overview. Uh, this is a, a product that, that is uh, basically looking at the different threat environments across the United States. And so from our perspective, we're looking at guidance. How do we provide from DHS, from the federal government, how do we give state and locals the guidance they need uh, when they're in the trenches. And then the second part is resource allocation. And what resources do they need? That certainly comes through me, uh, goes up the chain, possibly to the White House, and whether it's PPE equipment, grant resources, et cetera. So those are the really two things that we've been working on, guidance overall, and then how do we get them the resources that they need? I'll break there. Thank you very kindly. And now, Dr. Eastman, if I could pose the question to you, and of course you're focused largely on healthcare, but you see this, I'm sure, at the intersection of a number of other issues as well, healthcare as it relates to public safety and policing. So any comments about what's most on your mind and what you think we should be attentive to? Thank you. Absolutely, and thank you very much to Brookings for the opportunity uh, to be here this morning, to Deputy Assistant Secretary Doro, who, who uh, falsely attributed uh, the MVP of this crisis to me, their office has done, uh, he specifically and the Office of Partner Engagement and, and the Office of State and Local Law Enforcement has done perhaps the hard work of getting uh, the word out to our state and local law enforcement partners about just what resources are available. Um, like Brian said, I'm the Senior Medical Officer for Operations at DHS. I'm unique in the fact that um, I'm not only the department's only trauma surgeon on the staff, but I'm also the department's only dual credentialed law enforcement officer and, and doctor. So it puts me in the unique position. I lead our operational medicine program, hence the reason why uh, I'm currently uh, participating in this from sunny, beautiful uh, uh, rural Alaska uh, today. We're up here, and my team is up here um, helping the state of Alaska uh, with, with their response and in preparation for the upcoming commercial fishing uh, salmon season. Um, but, but uh, again, fr you're right in, in that I, I my day-to-day -day job is at the nexus and of, it's not just medicine, it's at the nexus of medicine and law enforcement and, and the homeland security of our country. And so from a law enforcement standpoint, I think the first, you know, sort of five critical messages, and one of them is really foundational, which is uh, our state, local, federal law enforcement officers around the United States have done heroic work to this point. And I think probably the most important thing that, that they need to hear and understand from their leaders is that uh, we will get through this and we will get through it together. 
Uh, it's going to be difficult and challenging, but it's not unlike many other challenges that we have faced in the United States before. And so some reassurance that we have uh, the knowledge and the ability to do this safely, I think, is, is very important. We have learned from everywhere uh, that has seen large outbreaks and have been hotspots already. My team over the last eight weeks has been in um, New York, New Jersey, uh, New Orleans, Detroit, Chicago, uh, Miami, Meatpacking, Kansas, uh, the Navajo Nation, and now Alaska. So we, we've literally been riding the wave of this and helping public safety and the medical community along the way. From a law enforcement standpoint, I, I think, you know, there's four critical things that have to be done from this point forward. Number one, uh, we've got to, to help our departments across the country understand exactly what an exposure is, what it isn't, and how you define that. And then that guidance is now pretty clear. It's out there. Um, it's it's uh, included in the uh, guidance document that Deputy, Deputy Assistant Secretary Doro uh, told you about. That guidance is really critical because that helps you understand sort of what the threats are and what they are not. And, and I think of all the calls I get constantly, um, that those are the, 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 the ones that, you know, officers and departments have the most concern about. From a second sort of uh, second part of that is, um, you, you know, departments, and agencies have to really, uh, hazards of doing this off of a phone, uh, departments and agencies have to um, adjust their strategy and tactics. For example, uh, at the Dallas Police Department, which obviously I know the best because I, um, you know, uh, like every cop, everyone has to have a side hustle. So I've got that one uh, that I'm still working, but um, every at the Dallas Police Department, we've adjusted uh, some of the call taking procedures to actually not dispatch officers on some low level crimes and run those through our telephone reporting unit. We've adjusted uh, individual officer tactics about staying, uh, you know, maintaining a six foot gap and not entering people's homes unless it's absolutely necessary. Not certainly not, you know, um, taking people out of situations that might put us at risk and, and changing the dynamic a little bit. So adjusting those that those actual tactics are important. I think from a large, from a law enforcement, you know, writ large perspective, um, clear, concise, understandable return to work guidelines after both an exposure or um, a, an actual COVID illness are really important for our personnel. They need to know what's going to happen once they recover and how they're going to come back to work. And then, and then the last thing I think is really important, and, and many people have alluded to this, but, um, and I will um, give a particular um, commendation out to my time um, in New Jersey with, with Pat Callahan and the guys there um, at the New Jersey State Police. I mean, the true regional approach that the state of New Jersey has taken during this crisis um, is a model that, that, quite frankly, we've encouraged other state and local jurisdictions to replicate because it really allows you to maximize the resources present in the region. And so, for example, if one part of your community is overwhelmed, you know, police departments do this all the time, we'll very easily move resources from one place to another and adjust um, uh, patrol levels and things like that. But if you, if you're, you know, healthcare systems aren't quite as used to doing that and certainly large states um, aren't quite as used to sharing resources across regions. So a true regional approach. And then the last thing I would say is that um, it is, is, it is a, a probably the, the thing that keeps me up at night right now is we're actually getting through what um, is probably the easy part of this. And the really difficult part, certainly for American law enforcement, is the coming months where um, we're going to see unprecedented um, unemployment difficulties around the United States and policing challenges from a population that's tired and frustrated and in some places um, hungry uh, that we just simply have never seen before in our lifetimes. And so I would um, say that what's critical, again, just to come back to the beginning, is that we are in this together. We're going to have the best science and practice and PPE and all the things that are available for the nation's first responders, but we have to work together to really get through what I think will be uh, the most difficult challenges our country's faced, certainly uh, in my lifetime. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm really glad to be here. Again, I'm sorry to be the, the only one, well, one of the only ones not in a tie and sitting here in the front seat of my car uh, or 
uh, in, in Alaska. But again, glad to be here and certainly we'll stick around to see if there's any questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, doctor. Where did you say you are in Alaska, if I could ask? Uh, currently, I'm in a very, uh, a sort of the very outskirts of Anchorage, getting ready to get on an airplane and, and head to southeast Alaska this morning. Well, again, thank you for joining us. I've got a number of questions already coming in from the audience, but I think I wanted to, while I'm, while I'm looking at those, give Paul, Rick, Jack, and John Allen the chance to pose any question that they would want to the panel, and then I'm going to go to those that we've received by, via email. So, uh, Rick, Paul, Jack, John, any questions that are on your minds that you'd like to put forth? Why don't we take a round from any of you who want to speak and pose a question, and we'll put all those together and come back to the panel. Paul? So, yeah, this, this is, this, go ahead, Jack. No, I, I was thinking along the lines of, uh, which, which would really bring uh, the uh, the issues that, that uh, the deputy superintendent and chief Pichardo and, and the doctor had just mentioned, which is since, since we've, um, we've suffered uh, greatly and we're worried about our, our, uh, our officers and, and troopers and, and agents, um, what is, what do we see as a, a resourcing uh, or a staffing model that's sustainable for, for something that's as, as uh, enduring as, as a, as a pandemic, right? So we've, we've probably suffered some, some attrition, some, uh, some uh, sick outs, as we know. Uh, but that also has some complications with how we staff and for how many hours maybe people have to work. And I would just throw that out to, uh, to, to our colleagues. Um, how should people think about that and how does that wear on, on the, on the uh, agencies? And then, Paul, do you want to add a question now as well, as well as Rick and John, yeah. and we'll come back to the panel. And I, and I think I'll segue off of that. <clears throat> we, we also have to think, and we heard, we heard the general, we heard Lori talk about a second wave. And in thinking in terms of the second wave and thinking in terms also of uh, resources and budget, um, what, are, what are we thinking about three months, six months, and 12 months out as it relates uh, uh, to uh, how we will handle this next wave, particularly from a law enforcement perspective, and again, particularly with, uh, with diminished resources? So what, what are we thinking as far as the police leadership to, uh, to address those uh, those uh, coming issues. And then Rick, before John. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Michael. I, I, would, I would ask uh, Jeff to articulate uh, a little bit more about the PPE formula uh, that they use uh, to be able to understand burn rates. And it has an application to what's going on now. It has an application to the second wave in preparing police departments on how to best prepare their uh, inventory. And I think uh, Dr. Eastman may have seen this uh, when he was in uh, when he was in New Jersey, and uh, I think that's very helpful if Jeff gets uh, an opportunity to articulate that. And then finally, my friend John Allen, before we come back to the panel. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> and I want to thank every one of the law enforcement uh, leaders and Dr. Eastman, who's also a law enforcement uh, leader, for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Eastman addressed this briefly, but I, I'd be interested in comments on this. What has changed? as a result of this crisis between the relationship of the police with our citizens change. And Dr. Eastman talked about the, the real potential that unemployment, uh, the slowness of the recovery of the economy and a sense of desperation, increasing desperation with large elements of the population that either feel disenfranchised now or are desperate because of the economic moment. Uh, how are we thinking now as law enforcement professionals and senior leaders who lead large formations of law enforcement uh, professionals, how are we thinking now about how we will address the potential change in the, 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 act, the conduct and the activities of our, of our civilians as time goes on? Because this is a, a desperate moment none of us have seen before, as Dr. Eastman said. How do we adjust to that and how do we take into account the desperation that we'll widely see in the in the civilian population. Thank you. And thank you for all you've done. Absolutely. So let me start, Chief Pichardo, if I could with you. I know that's a lot of questions. Don't feel the need to reply to each one. But why don't, you know, if each panelist could take one or two of the questions they most were moved by, and then we'll uh, come to the audience. Chief Pichardo, over to you, please. Sure, Mike. So great, great questions, by the way. And uh, I'll start with Jack and, and maybe I'll, I'll roll over to General Allen's uh, point 
And uh, to Jack's point, I mean, it's widely reported where we are a well-resourced police department, uh, certainly 55,000 uniformed and civilian. And, and even at our peak, as I stated earlier, with over 7,000, uh, our traditional shifts and tours are eight and a half hours. Uh, we work five on, two off of eight and a half hour shifts. And there was a point where we were considering, is it time for us to go to a traditional 12 hour shift um, in light of pandemics that we've we've done in the past, uh, Hurricane Sandy, major blackouts, 9-11, of course. Um, and then what we looked at was uh, some of those resources that because of the pandemic, because of what's going on with COVID, from the administrative capacity where things were generally getting shut down, um, we took those resources and we, and we took them out from those administrative positions and we threw in additional 500 police officers out in the street to backfill our patrol force because we figured if we went to those 12 hour shifts, we would now be probably contaminating even more of our members uh, as those shifts now become larger, even though they're only here for three days, that would probably go to about a hundred something police officers at any given 12 hour period in one facility as they're getting changed, as they're interacting with one another and so forth. So the ability to have those resources and be able to now take from our administrative capacity and those police officers to now flip them over and put them back out in the street to level off those officers that on patrol who were sick and were ill, COVID related and related illnesses, uh, to now put them back in a police car and answering those 911 calls was a tremendous advantage that we had. And to General Allen's point, I mean, look, the very foundation of, of everything that we do at the core of police work in law enforcement, no matter what part of the country or the world you are, it's human contact. It's engaging the public, both at community meetings or just waving good morning, shaking a hand, good afternoon, or responding to those 911 calls, uh, some serious calls, some not serious calls, and, and of course, dealing with crime and arresting perpetrators. So, so in its totality, the magnitude of police work, it is always engaging the public. And now we have to take a step back and say, how do we now re-engage that public? Uh, now it seems more and more we're doing some Zoom and Skype meetings, but how are we planning going forward? Well, we're really, really taking baby steps. We're, we're starting out with our, our traditional phone conferrals and uh, Zoom and web-based meetings uh, to actually socially distant meeting of, of small groups of two or three key individuals when something's going on. I mean, we're in a position now, and it's been reported on a number of uh, media outlets of some of the things that we're seeing because we're engaging the public in a different way, in a way that police officers, I would say, dare I say, across the country, but certainly for the New York City Police Department, never dreamt of being police. You know, it was always about the tradition of get a gun off the street, get a bad guy off the street, help the elderly lady across the street and the children. And now we're enforcing social distancing. So, so the realm of where we were and where we started to where we are now, is, it's a tremendous, tremendous difference in the lives of all police officers. And it's a tremendous ask. And, and I think they're doing very, very well uh, with something that was thrown at them and is very, very new to them. Uh, but it's certainly gonna take a lot as we re-engage the public, as we continue to work on building that trust that we've built on for a number of years uh, as we go into the perhaps the second phase, uh, as the summer comes uh, comes near, as the, the city starts to open again, uh, it's certainly going to have some challenges. But but I know the men and women in, in law enforcement, not only in this city but across the country, are more than apt to do it. Chief Noble, uh, Colonel Noble, excuse me, over to you, please. So, thank you very much. Just uh, first, and to answer uh, Colonel Fuentes is. Uh, question about our PPE uh, and, and how we are forecasting and how we're analyzing that burn rate. Um, early on, it was obviously uh, here, just like everywhere else, we, we knew that we were short PPE and trying to get the proper amount out to our officers was certainly critical. Um, so early on, we, we tasked one of, our, uh, one of our analysts to come up with a, with a tool to try to identify and measure the burn rate. And uh, I, I do think that's a significant Thing we can share to the other police commanders from across the country that, uh, and really what it did was it, it looked at every available data set, uh, such as staffing levels, population densities, resource requests that were coming in, of course, CDC guidelines that uh, we all know changed uh, slightly as we, as we went. 
but ultimately we now have this metric that we that we rely upon and after about eight weeks of data now i can share that uh, in in very general terms in new jersey our officers are and i when i say officers i'm referring to our frontline patrol troopers patrol officers this does also um factor in municipal officers as as well we did reach out and a lot of the data came from the city pds and the town and even the rural pds and in, on average uh, we're burning through two N95 masks per officer every three days. Now that's with the assumption that our officers are being told that to, to only use their N95 masks when they're going on a call where they have a higher likelihood of coming in contact with a COVID patient. And, and I realize that there's a lot of very difficult complexities in trying to identify uh, what that means, but that's the general guidance. They've also been going through one surgical mask or cloth type mask per shift. So uh, so that has helped us to be able to, uh, to procure, to make our, our budgeting requests, at least in the short term, at least over the next several months. Um, we also uh, realized that the burn rate for latex gloves for our officers was about one box every two weeks per officer. So we, we've taken this, this type of data and it's been critical for us because we recognize that when we're making these orders, just like everybody else, uh, it's taking months and months for these orders to be filled. So trying to come up with an accurate measure um, so that we can plan was certainly critical. And, and I hope that that information, um, and I'm, we're certainly willing to share that. Uh, and we also know that it changes every day as, as, as the data uh, comes in, but um, to help other officers or any other entities try to plan. We've also done a similar algorithm for firemen, paramedics, EMTs, and hospital workers. Cause like Colonel Fuentes said, as the statewide OEM coordinating agency, we are supplying, uh, we're the main hub to supply all those entities with, uh, with, the, with the PPE. So, uh, so this algorithm has proven to be one of our most, uh, I'll say successful, but I, I, I'm certainly not doing any victory laps by any stretch, but it, it, it's helped us manage the PPE currently and more importantly, uh, forecast it out. I also just wanna to touch on, on the other question about, um, about the resource, about the, how are we adjusting to uh, changing times and how are we preparing for it? Um, like Jack and like Colonel Allen we're, we're talking about. And for us, it is very important that the community looks at us not as the enemy, that we are in this with them, that we're in it together with them. And we know that, and we've already seen it. We've had, as I'm sure uh, NYPD has, we've had multiple protests and it's been very interesting dynamic for us. During the protests, we have our protesters who are I, I was, I've been out there myself, for the large part, very pro-police. Uh, it's unusual to be at a protest and have the average protester thanking us for law enforcement and saying, we support you, we support you. And at the same time, they're holding up signs like saying, hell no, we won't go. And it's a very interesting uh, position that we find our, our, ourselves in. But certainly, like the chief said, we have to be focused on, on messaging it that we are not anybody's enemy in this, that we are community members. We're with the community. We're working with our community partners. Never before do we need to rely on those relationships that we've built over the years. We've all built such great relationships with our partners, community partners, religious partners. And we, we have been and we will continue to let this is the moment when we take that, uh, when we take that uh, deposit out of the bank and we use it. And we now go back to them and say, we need to be together on this. And that's, what we're, that's really where we're at um, as far as whatever we can do to make sure that our plans as we prepare for potential uh, civil unrest or, 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 or uptick in crime, whatever it might be, that we're prepared um, in every step of the way. And of course, just sort of a boots on the ground um, uh, focus. We, we absolutely have contingency plans to reallocate our own resources. This is one of those times when we have to look um, internally at our own operations and say, what are going to be the most critical components of our operation to support a, a peaceful, safe uh, uh, town, to, uh, city, or, or state. And where we can, we may have to um, prioritize and staff those functions which are going to become most critical. And by that, I'm, I mean looking at sort of some of our admin functions and maybe putting more officers out on the street, putting more officers out in, in, these, in these meetings with our, certain, with our other uh, leaders. And, uh, and focusing our efforts and where they're most needed. So there's a, it's all planning, but this is the period of time when we are, um, we're working hard to, to get those plans in place so that we are prepared for anything. Thank you very much, Colonel.
Secretary Doro, and then over to Dr. Eastman. Thank you. Um, three, three areas of concern for DHS. Certainly the, the attacking of our critical infrastructure, soft targets, crowded places. Can't forget our, our cybersecurity uh, threats and then the violent extremism. It was talked about earlier. So DHS, we're constantly evaluating those areas. But the most important to our state and local partners, we know that as we're seeing around the United States, cities, villages, towns, states are opening up. Uh, people are trying to get back to work. And what we've been asked to do is, even though the, the CDC issued back to work guidance for the critical infrastructure and first responder community recently that, that you can certainly uh, take a look at on the website, we are trying to come up with different models for policing. A lot of our communities we know have departments that may have 15 officers or less. What is that gonna look like in the future when to a certain extent traffic stops start again? more consensual encounters with the general public. And so we've been actively looking at different models that we hope to have uh, different drafts for our law enforcement community uh, in the near future. Thank you very Great. much. And Dr. Eastman, over to you. Yeah, you know, I, I think I'm gonna go take the, uh, maybe an even higher, a little bit of a higher approach and just say, look, you know, um, what, what we did a year ago uh, will not resemble what we do a year from now. And our organizations writ large and, and policing in general, police organizations sometimes are slow to adapt. Now we've been forced to, um, we've been forced to, to uh, change our ways for the pandemic, but the things and the choices that we have to make and the way that we, um, change our operations for the future will, will define whether or not we're successful. I, I have no doubt that we'll be able to get there. I just think that we're going to have to work together. And I think, you know, my last um, uh, point that I'll make, and then actually my staff is literally tugging at me to get moving and get on this airplane. So um, what, what I was going to tell you is, is, look, if you don't have someone that can really give you high quality guidance and advice, uh, you know, a, a physician, a medical officer, someone who can um, help you uh, mix the scientific sort of guidance that's out there with the operational realities of law enforcement, then I would hope that you'd reach out to me, reach out to us, and let us either connect you with someone or, you know, if it's a phone call, I think most of the guys on this um, phone call will tell you, I'll, I'll take it myself and be glad to help where I can. Um, I'm I, I, I will tell you, I've got the best job in the world right now because I get to, um, I get to be a doctor. I get to still be a cop, and I get to help a lot of my brothers out there, brothers and sisters out there, um, on both fronts, both on the medical front and the law enforcement front. So, so let us let us help if you need it. And um, with that, I really apologize. I'm going to have to jump off for further questions. But again, uh, stay safe out there. We'll get through this, and uh, I, I hope. Um, if um, someone from, uh, I'm certainly not going to ask the generals to do it. If someone from Brookings can share my email with the rest of the group, um, I, I am more than happy to help um, in any way that I can. Thanks a lot. I got to run, you guys. Talk to you all soon. Doctor, be safe. You bet. Find out. Here. Stay safe. Well, I'm going to just Thanks, pose one final question. And I realize that Chief Pichardo and Colonel Noble and Secretary Doro may have to run soon. We're up against our two o'clock deadline, but I may take a a little bit of liberty with that deadline and ask one big question because we've had a number come in from the audience about trends in crime and concerns about crime. Some of the questions are about whether you're seeing higher crime rates in different areas as there are displacement effects uh, due to the virus and related implications. Some questions have to do with issues you've already touched on here today about domestic abuse and what kinds of trends you're seeing, what you expect in the future. Uh, another set of questions has to do with drug rings and whether you are seeing the ability of distributors uh, impeded. Are they having a harder time getting their product to people who work with them? Does that provide opportunities for law enforcement? That was one more additional question. There's also been a couple of people who have asked about gun ownership and the spike in gun sales that we know has resulted, as in many other crises of this type, if there ever has been something quite like this. But uh, people are wondering if that spike in gun sales has led to any consequences that you've witnessed. So there's a whole basket of questions around trends in crime. 
And obviously I'm not gonna ask you to explore all those dimensions. So out of that set of concerns, is there anything that you would most wanna hit on? And the very last question from the audience was about trends and how the police interact with the public, with potential informants, with potential criminals, and whether there might be a greater effort to keep distance and use sort of less close physical proximity and contact in future policing, if that's at all uh, realistic. Very last point is that Chief Pichardo alluded to concerns about potentially releasing some of the wrong people from jail. Maybe there's leeway to, to let go some older or less threatening convicts, but wondering if um, you want to say anything more about uh, trends that might concern you. So that big basket of questions, all over to you for your final thoughts of the day with, again, the thanks from all of us, starting with the chief in New York. So, so listen, I, I'll hit them real quick uh, for the sake of time. And of course, I, I want to listen to everyone else's uh, views on it. But as I stated earlier, crime has been down during the, the eight weeks that we've been here in New York City, 56 day period. Uh, the call volume of 911 has decreased. Um, one thing that we are extremely worried about is domestic violence, where we don't see because uh, these survivors are living with these perpetrators and obviously have nowhere to go right now. And the perpetrators themselves have nowhere to go. I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of unreported domestic violence crimes. So I think once the city opens up again, I think we're going to see an uptick in that and, and of course, some other crimes. Um, you know, across the city, we have five different district attorneys uh, who all have taken uh, different stances during different times, but certainly now more than ever have kind of all, all aligned with the fact that they're not looking to uh, prosecute uh, folks for these COVID uh, related uh, offenses during this time period. And there, some of them are just uh, strictly declining to prosecute some of these people. Some of them are deferring the cases for months ago. And, and as we know, um, when you defer a, a person who we've locked up, you know, the, just this morning, we, we arrested an individual who was already locked up in the past three weeks, about 12 times for commercial burglaries. I mean, talk about preying uh, on the defenseless. Like businesses and restaurants and shop owners have closed their businesses uh, an alliance with the with the governor's orders and the mayor's executive orders, but now we have a criminal out in the street who's, who's taking advantage of that individual and his or her family, and, and victimizing them, and then we arrest them, and they're back out in the street. So, so you couple those variables with with the release, and certainly, you know, someone who's who's older or, or who potentially was going to be released within the matter of of a couple of weeks, we, we can talk about the possible release. But how how do we release an individual? Uh, who, who's out on parole for rape and, and he's, he's in on a technical violation. And of course, tragically what happened, he came out and, and raped another, another woman. Uh, so, so those two factors, and I'll say the, the drug component piece, as we know, uh, traditional criminals and, and terrorists, they seek the opportunity when, when uh, crises hits. Uh, we're fortunate, again, that we, we've kept our task forces, our joint task forces with the DEA, state police, uh, FBI and, and other state and federal agencies running. I mean, just two days ago, we had uh, a seizure, a million dollar hit uh, off of one of our highways of heroin, coincidentally marked coronavirus. Uh, we, a couple of weeks ago, we had a nice hit of about seven to 10 kilos of heroin and, and fentanyl hybrid. So the criminals out there certainly looking to capitalize on it, uh, but, but so are our cops out there working with our task forces, working hard at hand. So. Uh, the landscape obviously is going to is going to change tremendously from the people that we allow into our facilities to what our police officers actually wearing to you know thermal readings as they come in to ensure their well being and their safety. Uh, but we're really concerned about the the crime spike uh, in the next couple of weeks. I mean burglaries and I said theft of autos has been through the roof during this 56 day period during this eight weeks where we've been uh, quote unquote on lockdown in the city. Uh, as a result of people staying home, obviously, and, and their cars being parked, and, and of course, uh, are all the commercial businesses closing now. So, so with that, I'll, I'll kick it over uh, to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Chief uh, Colonel Noble. Over to you, please. Thank you. Just uh, first, just like the chief, uh, very similar over here in in, uh, in New Jersey. Overall, shootings are down. Uh, however, murder 
officers are actually up, but number of shootings in New Jersey are, are down. Robberies are down 50%. We know that that's a, a short-term uh, trend. Uh, we also know that the, that the opportunistic criminals understand and recognize that the change in law enforcement posture, whether that's more tolerance that they may be seeing out on the highways with, with more speeders, whether that's the perceived uh, reduction in our available workforce. Um, we, we are very much focused on maintaining um, a, everything we can do to, to keep our eyes on the most dangerous criminals uh, that are out there. We, just like the chief said from New York, we, we are actively engaged with all of our task forces, all of our, all of our intel apparatus is at full strength. We are monitoring uh, and, and we are uh, physically responding to any physical threats, any organized uh, criminal element that's out there uh, dealing, whether it's, whether it's drugs and fentanyl, we, our investigative apparatus certainly are, are at full strength and, and we don't plan on, on, uh, on changing that. Um, but the reality is that there's this perceived, there's a perception out there that law enforcement's otherwise uh, busy doing other things related to, to COVID. So uh, that is a, a bit of a messaging piece. Uh, it is important um, just so we can, we can uh, prevent crime and we can prevent those that might be on the fence thinking about getting into, into crime and, uh, and knowing that we, we still uh, stand uh, on that line. And, uh, and so messaging that is something that that's part of our, of our strategy over the next uh, several weeks to months. Um, regarding changes of our the way we operate to um, operate in a COVID environment, we are looking at um, some tactical changes and looking at some things uh, by the manners in which we, whether it's conduct a traffic stop, whether it's conduct a roadside interview or, 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 an, or, an, or an investigation. Uh, we absolutely are looking at revamping some of our training and our, and our direction to our officers so that they can uh, conduct their investigations or, or conduct their, uh, their, their police work, yet doing so in a, in, a, in a responsible manner to try to protect themselves, whether that's wearing masks, whether that's having anybody that we come in contact with wear masks, uh, those are all uh, right now the focus of our of our training bureau and our and our tactical um, our tactical folks and we we do anticipate there'll be some changes to the manner in which we conduct our our frontline uh, frontline operations regarding that um, sales of guns yes absolutely are are up um, it's an issue we do we are experiencing a, a bit of a backlog that we're trying to work through with the licensing side of it. Um, but that being said, that offsets that is the fact that our shootings are down. As of right now, our, our shootings statewide are down about 20% from where they were last year. Back to you. Thank, thank you very kindly. And now, Secretary Doral, you'll have last word. Uh, and then uh, unless John yeah. Allen wants to also say farewell and thank you, I will conclude things with a brief uh, note of gratitude. But please, first, Secretary Doral, over to you. Yes, thank you. And again, I can't emphasize how grateful uh, both Dr. Eastman and I are, are that we are able to participate in this as an outstanding call. We do several of these each week, and certainly this is an outstanding. So thank you uh, for organizing, and I thank everyone who got on the call. Hopefully we provided you some, some good advice. And I just want to also say at DHS, we are a resource. If you need anything that we can help, state and locals, please reach out uh, to our office as well. I just want to finish up with the, uh, the drug question. That's of great concern to us. We know that high percentage of the nation's drugs flow over the southwest border. The southwest border, the points of entry are all closed at this time. Uh, we know that it may be slowing the amount of drugs coming into the country, but it's certainly not stopping. We're seeing other techniques used, such as the use of drones to get them over the border and other innovative ways. So I think at this time, one could say that it's slowing it down, but it's certainly not stopping the flow of drugs into the country at this time. Thank you very much. John, would you like to say anything to conclude before I also say farewell? I would, uh, Mike. I just want to thank everyone who was part of this today. Uh, General Robinson has dropped, but uh, we'll thank her separately. Uh, but for Paul and Rick, and uh, thank you for your long careers of tremendous service uh, to our people and to our country. And to Chief Pichardo and Lieutenant Colonel Noble, thank you very much for all that you're doing in New York City and in New Jersey. Uh, you are emblematic and representative of the law enforcement uh, leadership and law enforcement officials across this entire country. The sacrifices you make on our behalf every single day are deeply, deeply appreciated by all of us. And I wanna thank all of you for having participated in this this afternoon. Over to you, Mike.
Well, all I can say is amen. Uh, well said, John. Thank you, everyone. Really an honor for us. And we certainly intend to keep at this at Brookings so others can please, you know, the broader public and audience, please continue to weigh in with your suggestions, questions, and thoughts. But again, from Brookings, uh, signing off with gratitude to everybody. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.